I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. We're not worthy. We're not worthy. Got a spaceman, huh? No, actually, I'm a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I can't go anywhere without getting a boner. Again. How you doing? I live my life. Woo! The Rock says, Sweet baby Jesus in the office. Hey everyone, welcome to Wrestle Rock Podcast. I'm your host, uh, Nostrada Ben, and I'm very proud to host uh, this episode with my colleague, uh, Jonathan. How are you doing, friend? Yes, I'm going great. I'm going great. Yeah, so, um, thank you, everyone. Um, we're, you're watching Wrestle Rock Podcast, and tonight, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special guest, and uh, he is... Uh, Former. Six a former six-time WWE hardcore champion, one-time European champion, one-time tag team champion with uh, Mankind, and he's also a former ECW, a TNA talent, and now uh, we're talking uh, with uh, the current OVW owner, uh, Mr. Hal Snow. How are you doing today, my friend? Uh, I'm doing very well, and uh, thank you for uh, having me on your show. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Yes, uh, the, this is awesome that you uh, agree our invitation. Uh, as I said, uh, you are very busy with your uh, new acquisition. Uh, congratulations, first of all. So uh, I imagine that you have a, a lot of things uh, uh, about uh, this, uh, this new project. So uh, we know that uh, your friends, uh, Doug Basham, uh, came back to the ring uh, uh earlier so uh that and uh we follow you on uh fight uh <clears throat> on fight tv oh, so uh, we uh, we invite you to uh to watch uh all the, their uh amazing events the big uh, one honestly uh this is uh very cool the production is very nice and oh, um, and mostly the the talents are uh amazing amazing um so uh, we go forward uh, immediately with some question. Uh, go ahead, my friend. Yeah, of uh, course, uh, Mr. Sarvan. Uh, uh, first of all, why did you decide to become a pro wrestler? Uh, why did I decide to become a pro wrestler? A lot yeah, of people course. have asked me that over the years. And um, quite honestly, I don't know. Um, after 40 years, I still don't have an answer for that. <laughs> oh, um, okay. You know, I made that decision when I was 14 years old that 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 was what I was going to, going to want to do to uh, make a living and uh, have a career. And, um, you know, um, it was, it's never been easy, but it's been amazing. And I've been very blessed to get to do what I love to do for as long as I've gotten to do it. I say that all the time and I sincerely mean it, um, you know, uh, but I, I don't think if, if it's something that you really have a passion for, I don't think that you can ever quantify why it is you want to do it. You just feel driven to do something. And, you know, I'll ask that question of young, young uh, hopefuls who come up to me and, you know, oh, I want to be a professional wrestler. And the first thing I'll go, why do you want to be? And if they have an answer, I'm like, you probably shouldn't do it. Um, you know, because it, it, it's the people that could never really properly put it into words or even understand themselves why they pursue something that gives them the best chance to be successful. And who is the, the guy who, who gave you the best chance? Uh, who is your first uh, trainer? Uh, the uh, individual that broke me in that, that you know, when I, uh, at that time, because um, I broke in in 1982, so it was... It was a different, uh, there were still a long time ago, if you know yeah, what I mean. <laughs> years ago, long time. Um, and there were still rules uh, of conduct, there were still rules of etiquette, there were, you know, and there were consequences to not following those rules. And um, so when you were, you were brought in, um, it was almost like an apprenticeship, you know, you, you were brought in under a particular person, and uh, it was their responsibility 
to protect their own careers and their own livelihood to ensure that you knew everything that you possibly needed to know so that you were not a threat um, to doing business. And um, Jim Lancaster was the man who um, was willing, finally uh, convinced him to um, take me under his wing and take responsibility for me and put his name on me. And, um, you know, and I can't thank him enough. And uh, you're starting your career, um, except uh, for all snow uh, gimmick. What was your uh, favorite gimmicks and why uh, you, you know that you were wrestling with uh, back, um, for uh, Smoky Mountain and stuff like that? So uh, before I'll Snow, uh, we know that you were working with uh, Avatar, working at uh, Leaf Cassidy and... As uh, Leaf Cassidy, uh, yeah, exactly. with Marty Genity. Yes, exactly. Uh, what was your favorite gimmicks and why? Uh, I mean, I've, I've you know... Look, there, there was a, there is an incredibly wide, wide world of wrestling mm -hmm. outside of WWE. I know that may shock some people, but there were, at one time in the United States and in Canada, uh, there were, you know, regional territorial offices, and each office had a different direction, different vision, different idea. Mm -hmm. um, they all sold exactly the same thing. We were all unified in selling the exact thing. Thing. So you were able to go from one place to another, but you know, you'd go in for one and they'd have an idea for you as this, you'd go in and for another and they'd have an idea for you as something else, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and it's, it's integral that you develop that side of you um, because to really truly be a star and attraction, which is ultimately what you're really endeavoring to do. Um, you know, you need to know who you are so that the audience can describe you in a sentence or less. It's, I've said that for years now, that it's absolutely essential for, you know, the fans to be able to describe you to their friends and family, that there's this person and they're A, B, C, D, E. I mean, and if you think about it, anytime you really, really, really were caught up with a professional wrestler, whether they were a heel or a baby face, you were able to turn to your friends and family and go, Hey, you got to watch a show. There's this person in there, A, B, C, D, E. And succinctly, you were able to describe them. Um, and I've had lots of different iterations of gimmicks. You know, I've been a, a tag team wrestler uh, lots of times. I've been, you know, a uh, world tag team champion long before I was in WWE. Mm -hmm. Um You know, I've been regional champions, United States champion for the NWA. I've been, you know, uh, and those don't, you know, that that's six of one, half a dozen another. But um, I've been a heel. Uh, I was a heel for 14 years of my career initially. And uh, as Al Snow, as part of the uh, the Fantastics, as the part of the Sensational, as part of the Motor City Hitman, as part of, you know, any different number of teams, Um you know, uh, been, you know, uh, and that, and that really was, I think one of the things that kind of held me back for so many years, it was not having that definable personality and not developing it until I went to Smoky Mountain. And then I had that, you know, I was a smart ass, smarmy, uh, condescending, uh, uh, chicken heel, Uh, somebody would be willing to talk a good fight and then not, unless the guy's back was turned, wouldn't do it. Um, you know, and then when I came into WWE, you know, that was Vince's efforts to try to help create because he knew and understood how important it was because ultimately the only two things that we're selling in professional wrestling to an audience, the only two things that as an audience they are buying is who you are and why you're in the ring and to do what you're doing. That's, that's ultimately it. And, uh, um, it's very important. And, you know, um, I came in and, you know, they gave me the avatar thing uh, gimmick and, and, uh, it, it, you know, I dropped the ball. If I'd known then what I know now probably could have been a lot more successful with it. Um, you know, and then made, you know, I became leaf Casty, which was a great, you know, uh, opportunity with Marty because Marty does not get, and I've said this numerous times on other interviews, Marty does not get the appreciation or the respect that Marty deserves, you know, uh, granted, you know, Shawn Michaels, great personality, charisma, etc. 
you know, Marty taught Sean a lot of what he knows today. And Marty, Marty was an incredible, incredible worker. He just, Marty was very self-destructive and, and, you know, um, didn't handle things well in the back, uh, mm -hmm. in the locker room and in the, uh, you know, and pol politically, but, you know, there's a reason why Vince McMahon continuously brought Marty Jannetty back after Marty would do, would literally burn things to the ground. And then, you know, Vince would give him another opportunity and then Marty would do something and Vince would give him another opportunity that other people would never have gotten those many opportunities. And that's because Marty was so incredibly talented and uh, very, very talented and very. And I, I think, uh, you know, the perspective and the perception is that yeah. Marty but, is behind the scene of the, the careers of Shawn Michael. It's a little bit like uh, Ted DiBiase with Virgil or uh, many other uh, guys. Uh, Jim yeah. Ryder with Brett. Yeah, it's, it's practically the same thing. So, hell. So, uh, okay, Mr. Sarvan, you wrestled in uh, Smoky Mountain Wrestling. What was it like uh, to work with one of the most influential men in the business as Jim Cornette? Well, I love Jim Cornette. Um, you know, I can you hear me? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, uh, I love Jim Cornette. I think Jimmy is amazing. I think he's probably he's so hyper intelligent and and such a student of the wrestling business. And uh, you know, I, I'll forever be grateful to Jimmy to have had that opportunity to to work in Smoky Mountain and to to work with him. Uh, you know, I've known Jimmy since the early '80s, and you know. And uh, I have nothing but absolute respect for Jimmy. I think he's he's amazing. Yeah, and um, do you remember why we replaced Bob Ali at Survivor Series 1995? Why Bob Ali? Uh, um, to be clear, uh, you were supposed to be part of the uh, underdogs with uh, Gennady, uh, Akushi, and Barry Horowitz. And um, you were supposed to be against uh, the Body Donners with Skip Red Radford, uh, Tom Richards, and uh, Hicks Pock, uh, aka One Two Three Kid. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know exactly what transpired there. You know okay. what? What? What did you know? I, okay. I couldn't. If I told you uh, any kind of answer, it would just be pure speculation. I mean, I really, you know, I wasn't privy to the inner workings of what the office and what their decisions were. I don't know. Okay. Uh, which of these uh, two matches did you prefer in ECW against uh, Chris Benoit in 1995 in a 15-minute uh, match that was hailed as one of the best of the year or against the former ECW champion Shane Douglas at WrestlePalooza uh, 1998 and why? I loved them both. Um, you know, I know everybody asks that question. What was your favorite match? What was your favorite <laughs> match? Listen, <laughs> Every time I have gone in the ring, I've been, I, it, it's just such an amazing experience mm -hmm. uh, to do so. And, and I could not pick just one particular match that I favor more than another. Everything, I love every minute of every time I've ever been in that ring. Yeah, and um, you're talking about a pleasure in the ring. So uh, <laughs> uh, I imagine that... Uh, the head uh, imaginary is uh, who is behind this idea? Is it you or something else? Or oh, I uh, I head and I uh, were developed together. I came up with the idea, and uh, and we've had a wonderful yet contentious relationship ever since. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, what was your reaction when you found out? You were doing the opening match of uh, WrestleMania 15 in Philadelphia against uh, Billy Gunn and Arco Ali for the WWF Hardcore Championship. Uh, you know, I was very excited to be a part of it. And, uh, you know, I um, I don't think, you know, when you look back, you don't realize how monumental an honor and how uh, great an opportunity it is because you're so deep in the forest at the time. You don't really, you know, to me... When I was doing it, it, WrestleMania was just was another show because you know yeah. whether there were ten people or ten thousand or a hundred thousand, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to I'm going to just go a hundred percent no matter what. And um, 
you know, so that was my viewpoint. But now when I look back on it, I realize, you know, it was, it was an incredible opportunity to, to be featured on that show. And I wish that I had had more of that perspective at the time, uh, you know, because I just didn't have, I guess, the, the worldview to, to really appreciate the stage that I was given. Yeah, and uh, in addition, uh, you you wrestle with Billy and uh, Hardcore Holly, two of the experienced guys. Yeah, yeah, with a good performer, so that's a perfect fit. And in WrestleMania, that that's very very great. Well, uh, which um, we were talking about um, wrestling team, uh, wrestling team. So. Uh, Uh, you participate with Job Squad, Mick Foley, Marty Gennetti, that you're talking uh, earlier with Steve Blackman also. So, uh, I imagine that uh, we probably uh, know uh, the, the answer, but uh, which partner or partner did, partners did you uh, enjoy teaming up with the most? I imagine that probably all of this, but... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was always, it was always, you know, everybody had their strengths. Everybody, you know, we, we every, chem, every partner was a different chemistry. You know, the chemistry with Marty was completely different than it was anybody else. And I learned so much with Marty, both in and out of the ring. Uh, the partnership with Mick was, was fun. And, you know, um, and I really think we had a lot of uh, potential to do, go on to even greater things. Uh, Steve and I, I mean, Steve's such an awesome guy and, um, you know, to be able to, he was such a great straight man. Um, the, the vignettes that we did while we were together, I mean, they were so popular. They, they got the highest rated segments on SmackDown, um, you know, when we were doing them and, uh, you know, so I, yeah, every one of them was completely different and unique, but every one of them were, were so enjoyable and, and, and in their own way, they really were you know, uh, a blast to be a part of. During your car, uh, during, uh, your career, uh, you have been, uh, a coach for tough enough. So, uh, go ahead, my friend. Yeah. Can you talk about your uh, tough enough coaching experience? Sure. Uh, I think tough enough, um, is probably one of the things I'm very, very proud of as far as, you know, in the wrestling business. Um, you know, it was such a great vehicle to, Uh, recruit new talent to uh, develop and broaden the audience for professional wrestling. Uh, it was a w wonderful vehicle to, if you were already a wrestling fan, to increase your appreciation of just exactly how much hard work and effort and mm -hmm. that it goes into to be one, um, on a, and not just to get in, but on a continuous basis. Um, I think that it was... It was, it was a great vehicle for me. Uh, it gave, you know, to this day, people still come up to me and, you know, express how much they loved that show and, and loved me being on it and, and the kids. And, uh, I mean, what a wonderful, I can't say enough positive things about Tough Enough. It was such a wonderful experience uh, for me to be a part of the wrestling business and yet kind of doing my own thing. And, um, And I really, really enjoyed it. It was, it was really, it was really a terrific time. And about, uh, I don't remember how many seasons. Oh, uh, four, I think four. four. Yeah, I think four. I remember one of the the guys uh, called Maven. Well, uh, do you think that uh, Maven uh, consider you as a mentor? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'm not going to speak for Maven, but. I would imagine Maven and I have a, a really special relationship. I actually, all of all of the kids on Tough Enough, I have uh, a, a really wonderful relationship with each and every one of them. And you know that that was a blessing that came out of you know being a part of it was developing these relationships with all these kids. And um, and I'm, I'm I'll be forever grateful to uh, have had that experience. Okay. About uh, OVW, uh, Danny Davis was the first the first owner of uh, of OVW. In April uh, 2018, you acquired the OVW wrestling promotion. Why did you decide to buy a wrestling promotion and mostly OVW before Howl? 
uh, who knows? I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> maybe I decided life was too boring and I wanted to rib myself. I, I, <laughs> running a running a wrestling promotion is it's a monster. I don't know how I you know. I, I, as I get older, I get I continuously develop new uh, levels of respect for Vince McMahon for different reasons. And I got to tell you, since I bought OVW, I running OVW and trying to achieve what I'm trying to achieve here. It's a monster. I mean, it, it, it's a nonstop 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year monster. Mm -hmm. um, and that's here on this level. I cannot even begin to fathom what it takes, you know, or what it has taken for Vince to achieve the success that he has achieved on the level that he's achieved it and then maintain it. I, I, the man's incredible. And, and we should all, every one of us that are wrestling fans should give him, instead of berating and belittling him, we should all tell him, you know, immensely thank you because if it weren't for him, the, the wrestling business, you know, right now, and you love and you love to harangue and shit on, that wouldn't exist. It, it, it just wouldn't. And uh, be aware of that. You know, it, you think, it, you all think, everyone out here listening right now and watching this podcast, you all think that you could even some way, to some degree, be able to manage and to achieve that kind of success or make it even more successful. You're insane. Because I personally, this is all I've done for a living. And, and, and the biggest challenge I have ever had is, is I'm undertaking right now, which is, is, is managing OVW and trying to grow it. Um, you know, it, it just, uh, the words cannot describe to you, um, you know, how much of a challenge it is. And, and uh, the intricacies and the and the nonstop fires that you constantly have to run around and put out. No sooner have you put one out, there's another tree that's caught on fire. And it's, you know, imagine the California forest fires and you're trying to put them all out with a, one single bucket of water. <laughs> you know? I imagine so. Uh, and when you take the decision, bah, it is what it is, my friend. Uh, if you make a decision, I mean, it affects your responsibility and your decisions affect yes. everyone. And of course, everyone second guesses and knows better than you. Cause even though they don't get to see the full picture, they, you know, they assume that because they have a bit of information that they now have a knowledge that equates to what you understand. And yeah, you never, and you never win. I mean, you know, uh, if this succeeds, if OVW really finally, you know, tips over the mountain and, succeeds well you know then we all have succeeded but if this so if, if OVW fails let's be honest at the end of the day I failed nobody else nobody else part of OVW will fail I will you know and yes. um and so I realized that and uh and and why did I do it like I said I that was not that was not the plan that was not in my vision that wasn't in my goals it wasn't the direction but um, I met my business partner, Chad Miller. Uh, he was the executive director of the Kentucky Wrestling Boxing Commission at the time. I went to the, uh, the uh, board meeting of the uh, Kentucky Boxing Wrestling Commission to appeal to them to create standards for professional wrestling training. Um, okay. I'd already addressed those concerns with Maryland and Louisiana and uh, several other states that have wrestling commissions and they all blew me off um and i i just i found it insulting that in any state in the united states that you want to be a licensed professional in any other vocation uh hairdresser um a masseuse uh barber mortician um you had to attend a state accredited school you got to be taught by a state accredited teacher you've got to complete a number of uh, hours of training. You've got to have a certain amount of residency training, hands-on experience before you can even take a test to get your license to practice that vocation. In professional wrestling in the United States, and I'm sure it's probably the same in Canada, mm -hmm. you literally just pay your money and you get a license and you're done. That's it. You might have to take a physical, but yeah. that's the extent of it. 
And anyone, anyone can get a hair up their ass and can proclaim, you know what? I know enough about professional wrestling. I'm now going to teach people, even though they may have never had the experience uh, that actually equates to real knowledge that they can then communicate to a prospective student. They just rent a building, they get a ring, and off we go. They start training people. And uh, because of that lack of standards and that lack of accountability <clears throat> with regards to training, uh, you know, uh, it, that has led to the degradation of professional wrestling. And, and I really, it frustrates me. But ultimately, that was how I met Chad Miller. Uh, and then one thing led to another, and Danny was ready to retire, and he broached the subject, and ta-da, here I am. So... <laughs> Well, go in, my friend. Okay, currently, uh, you wrestled in a tag team uh, match uh, with uh, Doc Basham on the OVW called The Big One event yeah. live on uh, Fight TV, and you defeated Joe Mack and Adam Revolver. Can you talk about uh, this experience? Well, it was, it was you know, um, I did it uh, really primarily. I did it for a number of reasons. One is that, you know, I wanted to... It was special because uh, typically... I tried very, very hard not to put myself on the show in any manner because, um, you know, uh, regardless of what anybody would think, if you're in front of the camera as a talent, you should not be uh, in the office or in charge of the show backstage. Mm -hmm. um, there should be a delineation between the two because there's always a conflict of interest. It, it, even if it's just no more than I'm trying to focus on and sell everyone else in OVW, but the minute that I become a part of the show, that focus shifts to some degree uh, from everyone else to now just solely me. Mm -hmm. I've got to be worried about me and my segment, my match, whatever. And so I really go out of my way not to, I'm very reticent about wanting to put myself on the show. But, um, you know, I got to talked into it by my other business partners and And, uh, and I just, I did it as an, a special attraction to kind of really boost the attention for the show, that particular show. I am not going to be doing anything with it going forward. I can assure you, um, you know, and, uh, you know, not that I know of, I mean, I, you know, if, if, if it's good business, I'll do it, but, but really, it, um, you know, I, I don't like to, like I said, because I want to try to keep that focus as much as possible on, on, uh, everyone else on all of the other talent. I've, you know, I can still physically go and do what I need to do and not be an embarrassment. And as long as I can do that, occasionally I'll pop up doing things here and there. But my focus with OVW is to build and create opportunities and a platform to sell all of the, uh, the other talent. But, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was, it was a great, uh, Uh, really fun match and we really got an incredible reaction out of the audience and and uh and i think i hope that for the talent that we're watching they could see how you know doug and myself took little or nothing um and did little or nothing and we worked towards things and made the, even the smallest thing mean as much as possible that then really elicited Uh, a reaction and entertained an audience and, you know, more so than just doing a hundred things. And, uh, um, and that I hope was a, you know, I also did it as a, a, as an example and a lesson and, you know, another lesson I learned from Vince McMahon for years. And that is that I'll never ask anyone to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. So. Yeah. So, uh, for ending, uh, my friend, so, uh, <laughs> My partner, Benoit, a.k.a. Nostradamus Ben, uh, tried to predict your future, so go ahead. <laughs> first, of all, first of all, Mr. Sarven, uh, thank you so much for the interview. It was uh, huge, amazing. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, and I predict you uh, many, many success with your uh, OVW business and, uh, of course, OVW talents. Yeah. Thank you. You're on, you on the right way. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know what I mean. Yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm uh, hoping that uh, the future will continue to allow OVW to not just survive, but thrive and grow. And, you know, my, my endeavor, my goal is to create a platform where young up and coming talent can develop themselves and get opportunities on 
grander, bigger stages, and um, and also to create a platform that allows former uh, talent that were on bigger stages to come back, have a place to reinvent themselves, and then get another opportunity to do it again. So, and you have a good asset with Al Snow, yeah. Doug Basham, and many other uh, in the direction. So, absolutely, uh, yes. Uh, we wish you all the best with your promotion. Thank you so much. Uh, once again, this, it was a, a pleasure and uh, an honor. Thank you so much, my friend, and uh, have a great day. Uh, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate the time. Best of wishes. Goodbye. Take care. Yes, Take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye.